Hello everyone, Miss Smith here to look at your home learning video for English with you today. I hope that you are all safe and well. Today is Wednesday the 24th of February 2021. And today our success criteria says that we were wondering how to describe a character. The new text that we are looking at in English is George's Marvelous Medicine. So, so we'll be describing, thinking about a character from that story. To do this today, we're going to need to know what similes are, what metaphors are, and what noun phrases are before uh, are as well. And that's something we've looked at before at school and as part of our home learning. But we'll remind ourselves of what they are today as well. For the middle part of our success criteria, we need to be able to use different writing tools. So the things that we know about how to construct a good and an interesting sentence to describe a character. And to do that, we're going to be using our five senses. We used our five senses as part of our home learning in term three, when we pretended that we were Leon in the place between, and that we were using our five senses to describe what it was like when he entered the box and ended up in the place between. And we'll recap what those five senses are a little bit later on as well. The first thing that we're going to do in English today is to look at our SPAG starter. SPAG stands for spelling, punctuation and grammar, checking that we've got all of our skills there. And our starter is very similar to our recap that we have in maths. It's just reminding ourselves of the things that we have previously learned. For our SPAG starter today, we're going to be looking at coordinating conjunctions. A coordinating conjunction is used to connect different words, phrases, sentences together. Some examples of coordinating conjunctions are words like or and um, and and but or and but. Um, what I would like you to do now is to fill in the blank spaces with the best coordinating conjunctions. So the best way to do that is to read the sentence say it out loud and check which one of these coordinating conjunctions sounds the most suitable in that blank space i'll do the first one with you i want to buy my present my brother a present mm, i don't have the money so let's start putting those coordinating conjunctions in now and see which one sounds best i want to buy my brother a present or i don't have the money i want to buy my brother a present and i don't have the money I want to buy my brother a present, but I don't have the money. Pause the video for one second. Say that sentence out loud with each of the coordinating conjunctions in the blank space and decide which one you think sounds best. If you said the correct coordinating conjunction was but, you are right. I want to buy my brother a present, but I don't have the money. So what that person is saying there is that they want to buy their brother a present, but they're unable to do that because they don't have the money or or and wouldn't make sense in that sentence. Have a look at the next two sentences. My favourite pizza is either margarita, something Hawaiian pizza. It is my birthday tomorrow, something I am so excited. So try out each of these coordinating conjunctions or and or but. Copy the sentence out and write the correct coordinating conjunction in the blank space. Remember um, to pause your video and take the time to do that. Say the sentences out loud and check which ones make sense. Pause the video, take four minutes to get that done and then we'll look at them together. So now I have put the correct coordinating conjunction in the missing spaces for those sentences. My favourite pizza is either margarita or Hawaiian pizza. And I've used the coordinating conjunction or there because it's a choice between two things. It is my birthday tomorrow and I am so excited. By using the coordinating conjunction and we're putting together those two pieces of information that it is the person's birthday and that they are very excited about it. So over the last couple of days, you've been introduced to the author role doll. On Monday, you may have watched some videos of our lovely staff at school reading some of the different stories that Roald Dahl has written. Things like The Enormous Crocodile, Matilda, Mr. Fantastic Fox and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yesterday, we explored the title and the blurb of the story George's Marvelous Medicine. 
We thought about why the author might have used the particular language that he did as part of the blurb, what the illustrations tell us, and we had a go at pretending we were like George and we were creating our own medicine. To do that, we had to use our inference skills to decide what ingredients we would use, what the method would be, and what the purpose of our medicine was as well. And I decided that I was going to have a special medicine that helped people learn to fly. Today, we're going to move on to looking at the language, the words and the description that Roald Dahl has used in his book in a little bit more detail. I'm going to start by reading chapter one of George's Marvellous Medicine to you, and that chapter is called Grandma. I'm going shopping in the village, George's mother said to George on Saturday morning, so be a good boy and don't get up to mischief. This was a silly thing to say to a small boy at any time. It immediately made him wonder what sort of mischief he might get up to. And don't forget to give Grandma her medicine at 11 o'clock, the mother said. Then out she went, closing the back door behind her. Grandma, who was dozing in her chair by the window, opened one wicked little eye and said, Now, you heard what your mother said, George. Don't forget my medicine. No, Grandma, George said, and try to behave yourself for once while she's away. Yes, Grandma, George said. George was bored to tears. He didn't have a brother or a sister. His father was a farmer and the farm they lived on was miles away from anywhere, so there were never any children to play with. He was tired of staring at pigs and hens and cows and sheep. He was especially tired of having to live in the same house as that grisly old grunion of a grandma. Looking after her all by himself was hardly the most exciting way to spend a Saturday morning. You can make me a nice cup of tea for a start, Grandma said to George. That'll keep you out of mischief for a few minutes. Yes, Grandma, George said. George couldn't help disliking Grandma. She was a selfish, grumpy old woman. She had pale brown teeth and a small, puckered up mouth like a dog's bottom. How much sugar in your tea today, Grandma? George asked her. One spoon, she said, and no milk. Most grandmas are lovely, kind, helpful old ladies, but not this one. She spent all day and every day sitting in her chair by the window, and she was always complaining, grousing, grouching, grumbling, griping about something or another. Never once, even on her best days, had she smiled at George and said, Well, how are you this morning, George? Or, why don't you and I have a game of snakes and ladders? Or, how was school today? She didn't seem to care about other people, only about herself. She was a miserable old grouch. George went into the kitchen and made Grandma a cup of tea with a tea bag. He put one spoon of sugar in it and no milk. He stirred the sugar well and carried the cup into the living room. Grandma zipped the tea. It's not sweet enough, she said. Put more sugar in it. Gram George took the cup back to the kitchen and added another spoonful of sugar. He stirred it again and carried it carefully into Grandma. Where's the saucer? she said. I won't have a cup without a saucer. George fetched her a saucer. And there's an illustration there. We can see George is in the front room. Grandma's in her chair by the window. And she's got her cup with her saucer now, which is like a really tiny plate that you put underneath the cup. And what about a teaspoon, if you please? I've stirred it for you, Grandma. I stirred it well. I'll stir my own tea, thank you very much, she said. Fetch me a teaspoon. George fetched her a teaspoon. When George's mother or father were home, Grandma never ordered George about like this. It was only when she had him on her own that she began treating him badly. You know what's the matter with you? The old woman said, staring at George over the rim of her teacup with those bright, wicked little eyes. You're growing too fast. Boys who grow too fast become stupid and lazy. But I can't help it if I'm growing fast, Grandma, George said. Of course you can, she snapped. Growing's a nasty, childish habit. But we have to grow, Grandma. If we didn't grow, we'd never be grown-ups. Rubbish, boy, rubbish, she said. Look at me. Am I growing? Certainly not. But you did once, Grandma. 
only very little, the old woman answered. I gave up growing when I was extremely small, along with all the other nasty childish habits like laziness and disobedience and greed and sloppiness and untidiness and stupidity. You haven't given up any of those things, have you? I'm still only a little boy, Grandma. You're eight years old, she snorted. That's old enough to know better. If you don't stop growing soon, it'll be too late. Too late for what, Grandma? It's ridiculous, she went on. You're nearly as tall as me already. George took a good look at Grandma. She certainly was a very tiny person. Her legs were so short that she had a footstool to put her feet on, and her head only came halfway up the back of the armchair. Daddy says it's fine for a man to be tall, George said. Don't listen to your daddy, Grandma said. Listen to me. But how do I stop myself growing, George asked her. Eat less chocolate, Grandma said. Does chocolate make you grow? It makes you grow the wrong way, she snapped, up instead of down. Grandma sipped some tea but never took her eyes from the little boy who stood before her. Never grow up, she said, always down. Yes, Grandma. And stop eating chocolate, eat cabbage instead. Ew, cabbage? Oh no, I don't like cabbage, George said. It's not what you like and what you don't like, Grandma snapped. It's what's good for you that counts. From now on, you must eat cabbage three times a day. Mountains of cabbage. And if it's got caterpillars in it, so much better. Ew, George said. Caterpillars give you brains, the old woman said. Mummy washes them down the sink, George said. And there's another illustration of Grandma leaning into George. She talked to him and George backing away because he's not really enjoying this conversation. Mummy's as stupid as you are, Grandma said. Cabbage doesn't taste of anything without a few boiled caterpillars in it. Slugs too. Not slugs, George cried out. I couldn't eat slugs. Whenever I see a live slug on a piece of lettuce, Grandma said, I gobble it up quick before it crawls away. Delicious. She squeezed her lips together tight so that her mouth became a tiny wrinkled hole. Delicious, she said again. Worms and slugs and beetly bugs. You don't know what's good for you. You're joking, Grandma. I never joke, she said. Beetles are perhaps the best of all. They go crunch. Grandma, that's beastly. The old hag grinned, showing those pale brown teeth. Sometimes, if you're lucky, she said, you get a beetle inside the stem of a stick of celery. That's what I like. Grandma, how could you? You find all sorts of nice things in sticks of raw celery. The old woman went on. Sometimes it's earwigs. I don't want to hear about it, cried George. A big, fat earwig is very tasty, Grandma said, licking her lips. But you've got to be very quick, my dear. When you put one of those in your mouth, it has a pair of sharp nippers on its back end. And if it grabs your tongue with those, it never lets go. So you've got to bite it. So you've got to bite the earwig first, chop, chop, before it bites you. George started edging towards the door. He wanted to get as far away from this filthy old woman. You're trying to get away from me, aren't you? She said, pointing a finger straight at George's face. You're trying to get away from Grandma. Little George stood by the door, staring at the old hag in the chair. She stared back at him. Could it be, George wondered, that she was a witch? He had always thought witches were only in fairy tales, but now he was not so sure. Come closer to me, little boy, she said, beckoning him with a horny finger. Come closer to me and I will tell you secrets. George didn't move. Grandma didn't move either. I know a great many secrets, she said. And suddenly she smiled. It was a thin, icy smile, the kind a snake might make just before it bites you. Come over to Grandma and she'll whisper secrets to you. George took a step backwards, edging closer to the door. You mustn't be frightened of your old Grandma, she said, smiling that icy smile. George took another step backwards. Some of us, she said, and all at once she was leaning forward in her chair and whispering in a throaty sort of voice George had never heard her use before. Some of us, she said, have magic powers that can twist the creatures of this earth into wondrous shapes. 
A tingle of electricity flashed down the length of George's spine. He began to feel frightened. Some of us, the old hag went on, have fire on our tongues and sparks in our bellies and wizardry in the tips of our fingers. Some of us know secrets that would make your hair stand straight up on end and your eyes pop out of their sockets. George wanted to run away, but his feet seemed stuck to the floor. We know how to make your nails drop off and teeth grow out of your fingers instead. George began to tremble. It was her face that frightened him most of all. The frosty smile, the brilliant, unblinkering eyes. We know how to have you wake up in the morning with a long tail coming out from behind you. Grandma, he cried out, stop! We know secrets, my dear, about dark places where dark things live and squirm and sliver all over each other. George made a dive for the door. It doesn't matter how far you run, he heard her saying. You won't ever get away. George ran into the kitchen, slamming the door behind him. And there's an illustration of George in the kitchen with the door shut. Now that we've read chapter one together, I'd like you to think about these two questions. What do you think of George and what do you think of grandma? So from the story that you've just read, think about descriptive words, adjectives to describe both of their personalities, who they are. So um, a personality trait is things like being hardworking, being funny, and also think about how you would describe their personality. So now pause the video for five minutes. Think of at least three ways to describe George's personality and his appearance and three ways to describe grandma's personality and her appearance as well. You can either think those about those things in your head or you can write them down in your notebook as well. Pause the video for five minutes and then we'll come together and have a discussion. So some of the things that I thought about to describe George, if I was going to speak about his personality, from reading this chapter, I'd say that he was quite helpful because he did all of the things that grandma asked him to do. When she wanted more sugar, he went and got it. When she wanted a saucer, he went and got it as well. From the illustrations, I can have an idea of what George looks like. I could say that George is a small boy. Um, I might not be able to describe what he's wearing because these illustrations are black and white pictures. When I want to think about grandma, if I was going to describe her personality, I could say things like selfish because she orders George around and doesn't do things for her, um, doesn't do anything herself. I might say that she's grumpy, she's unkind, she says things to George that she knows will upset him. And if I was going to describe her appearance, I can use some of the descriptive language that is used to describe grandma in the George's Marvelous Medicine story. I could talk about her brown teeth and her wrinkled lips as well. So maybe you had some of the same ideas as me or maybe yours were slightly different. So as I said, when we looked at our success criteria, today we are going to be describing grandma using metaphors, metaphors, similes and noun phrases. Pause the video for two minutes and think to yourself, can you remember what a metaphor, a simile or a noun phrase is? If you can't remember, that's absolutely fine because we will look through them together as well. OK, so a metaphor is used to describe something as if it was something else, saying it is something. So you don't necessarily use like or as when you use a metaphor. You could say something like she is a shining star. Eyes wide, um, eyes, her eyes were wide as like saucers, OK? She is a shining star. She is brave. You're saying that something is like something else. After we've been introduced to a metaphor, we think about a simile. A simile is used to describe something by comparing it to something else. And this is when you use like or you use as. You don't necessarily use like or as for a metaphor. You might say something like, it is like an oven in here. The boy was as brave as a lion. The girl was as funny as a clown. You're comparing one thing to something else. Then we have a noun phrase. A noun phrase is when you have an adjective, which is a describing word, and a noun. A noun are things like people, places or objects. Here we've got George. George, I'm going to highlight in yellow. George is the noun. It's a person. Marvellous medicine. Marvellous is the um, adjective. And also medicine 
will go yellow because medicine is the noun, it is the object. So if you have a noun phrase, you have an adjective, something like marvellous, you then have the noun, a person, a place or an object afterwards. So now we're going to look at this extract of a piece of writing from chapter one of George's Marvellous Medicine. And we're going to see if we can use any of these descriptive tools um, from the writing. So looking for where Roald Dahl has used metaphors, where he has used similes, and where he has used a noun phrase. Remember, a metaphor is when you describe something as something else, you won't use like or as. A simile is when you compare something to something else using like and as, and a noun phrase is when you have an adjective before a noun. I'll read this to you first. Some of us, she said, as she, and all at once she was leaning forward in her chair and whispering in a throaty sort of voice George had never heard her use before. Some of us, she said, have magic powers that can twist the creatures of this earth into wondrous shapes. A tingle of electricity flashed down the length of George's spine. He began to feel frightened. Some of us, the old woman went on, have fire on our tongues and sparks in our bellies and wizardry in the tips of our fingers. Some of us know secrets that would make your hair stand up straight on end and your eyes pop out of their sockets. George wanted to run away, but his feet seemed stuck to the floor. We know how to make your nails drop off and your teeth grow out of your fingers instead. George began to tremble. It was her face that frightened him most of all, the frosty smile, the brilliant unblinking eyes. We know how to make you wake up in the morning with a long tail coming out from behind you. Grandma, he cried out, stop! And I'm going to stop reading there because this sentence uh, isn't complete at the bottom. It goes on to the next page that we don't have. So now pause the video and spend about five minutes looking through this extract from chapter one. What metaphors have been used? What similes and what noun phrases? Then we'll come back together and look as a group. Okay, so here I've highlighted some examples of metaphors. Maybe you found some that were slightly different to me and you can send us a message to let us know what you discovered as well. So here I've highlighted a tingle of electricity, fire on our tongues, sparks in our bellies, wizardry in the tips of our fingers. So this is descriptive language, a tingle of electricity. You're comparing the tingle that um, grandma feels, uh, you, sorry, we're describing the tingle that um, George feels down his spine and electricity, comparing those two things, so that's the metaphor. Sparks in our belly, we're comparing the feeling of something in your in your belly to spark. So again, that's a metaphor comparison to something else. If you found any different metaphors, noun phrases or similes in chapter one, let us know because there are lots of examples throughout the George's Marvelous Medicine story. And down here we have a noun phrase, phrase brilliant unblinking eyes brilliant and unblinking they are the adjectives they're describing words and eyes is a noun it's describing an object okay so now it's time for us to put our creative writing skills to use and we're going to be describing grandma using our five senses and thinking about those metaphors those similes and those noun phrases as well so let's remind ourselves of the five senses. We have sight, which is all to do with our eyes, the things we see. Hearing, all to do with the sounds that we can hear around us, that is our ears. For our hands, we have touch receptors in our fingertips. For number uh, four, we have our smell, sense of smell, which is our nose, what we can smell around us, whether it's a nice smell or a not so nice smell. And then our mouth, on your tongue, it has lots and lots of little bumps. And those tongues are what help you to taste things. So our five senses that we're thinking about are sight, hearing, touch, smell and taste. So the first thing I've done is write the word grandma and underline it because that's like my title. It's who I'm going to be writing about today. And I'm going to be thinking about those five senses. I'm going to write the names of the five senses up here to remind me. We've got sight, smell, hear, oh, hearing, touch and taste. And I put those there because if I forget any of the five senses, that will be able to remind me. Sight, smell, hearing, touch and taste. And when I'm doing this, I want to be thinking about my metaphor. So metaphor is when you compare something to something else, something like she is a shining star. 
Um, I'm also thinking about a simile, so comparing something to something else, using words like like or as, and a noun phrase, which is when you have an adjective describing a word, followed by a noun, and a noun is talking about a place, a person, or an object. Okay, so this is my first sentence. It says, George stared at Grandma, and her small black eyes stared back. So in this sentence, what have I used? A metaphor, a simile, or a noun phrase? I have used a noun phrase because small and black are adjectives, they are describing words, and eyes is a noun because it is an object. I'm going to do one more with you and then we'll have a look and see what ones you can do by yourself. And also, in my first sentence, the sense that I've described is sight. So now that I've described sight, I'm going to cross it off my list and know that I can focus on one of these because if George is looking at his eyes to stare at grandma, he's using his sense of Okay, so for number two, I've used my sense of smell. So I'm going to cross this out and I know um, if I've used my sense of smell in this sentence because I'm talking about George's nose and I've used the word smelly there as well as smell. It's a sense of smell um, is obviously connected to your nose and your sense of smell. This sentence says, George crinkled his nose, which means he screwed it up as if he could smell something unpleasant. George crinkled his nose. Grandma was as smelly as a dustbin. So grandma was as smelly as a dustbin. What have I used there? A noun phrase, a metaphor or a simile? You're right. What I've used there is a, is a simile because I've compared grandma to something else and I've used the word as. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is to pause the video, spend about 10 minutes writing your own um, sentences. You'll need five sentences all about grammar with description, thinking about similes, metaphors and noun phrases. How can you use each of them and the five senses, sight, smell, hearing, touch and taste. I'll have a go at doing some more and then we'll look when we come all back together. Okay, so now that you've finished looking at your sentences to describe grandma using the five senses, which are sight, smell, hearing, touch and taste, I'm just going to go through the last three that I wrote. So for number three, I knew from my list that the last thing I needed to write about was hearing. I wrote grandma heard, and because it's heard, I obviously know it's talking about the sense of hearing. Grandma heard, George heard grandma cackle, and cackle's a word for a high-pitched bit of an evil laugh. George heard grandma cackle. She is a wicked witch, he whispered. What have I used there? A metaphor, a simile, or a noun phrase? What I have used is a metaphor, so I'm going to put it in pink. She is a wicked witch, he whispered. So I haven't used like or as there, so it's not a simile, but I've compared grandma to something else. For num so then on my list, I'm going to cross out hearing because I've spoken about that sense. For number four, I'm thinking about the sense of touch, what something feels like. George touched grandma's hand. I've used the word touch there. George touched grandma's hand. It was as cold as ice. What is that? Metaphor, simile or noun phrase? You're right, it is a simile because we've compared grandma to something else. Grandma's hand obviously isn't made out of ice because she's a person, but what George is doing is saying that it is as cold as that object. George touched grandma's hand, it was as cold as ice. So I will cross out touch on my list of senses. Number five is taste. Grandma sipped her tea. This is a disgusting drink, she bellowed. Four, can you see a noun phrase, an adjective? Oh, sorry, can you see a noun phrase, a metaphor, and or a simile in that sentence? Grandma zipped her tea. This is a disgusting drink, she bellowed. So what we've got there is a noun phrase because disgusting is an adjective, it's a describing word, and drink is a noun, it's an object. Okay, well done guys, you have worked super hard today. When you are finished, there's a bit of a challenge here for you. It says, finish the paragraph describing grandma. Try and include at least one metaphor, one simile or one noun phrase. The skin on grandma's hand felt like what? Grandma had something eyes. If she were a food, she would taste like. 
And then when you're finished, you could challenge yourself even further by writing a descriptive sentence about George using the five senses. Well done, you've worked really hard today. I can't wait to see what sort of descriptive language you come up with to describe grandma. Enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you for your home learning video tomorrow. Bye.